rated T to M. Hey, want to hear a PC Game Pass ad? I'll take your silence as a yes. Want new games on day one like Call of Duty Black Ops 6 or Stalker 2? I thought so. How about unlocking all the League of Legends champions when you link your Riot Games account? All for one low monthly price? Well, guess what? We got you. Learn more at xbox.com slash PC Game Pass or click the banner. Stalker 2 available November 20th, 2024. Game catalog varies by region and over time. And that's the end of the script. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes in detail. The election didn't end like we all hoped but we're continuing to fight the good fight here at the DSR Network. We'll still be bringing you the best expert analysis on the most important issues here in the U.S. and from around the world. To support what we do, please consider becoming a member. Members receive an ad-free listening experience, exclusive content, access to our community Discord, and more. Use code DEEPSTATE at the dsrnetwork.com slash buy for 40% off your subscription. That's code DEEPSTATE at the DSRnetwork.com slash buy for 40% off. The fight isn't over, so we hope you'll join us. Thank you. This is the Daily Blast from the New Republic, produced and presented by the DSR Network. I'm your host, Greg Sargent. We still have months to go until Donald Trump takes office, but according to the Washington Post, Trump's top allies are already at war with each other over the transition. On top of that, Trump just tapped an anti-Islam extremist, Sebastian Gorka, to a top national security role, and that's unnerving even some in MAGA. It's becoming clear that Trump is so certain he won a massive mandate in the election that he doesn't need to even bother running a smooth transition or take care to avoid appointing wildly extreme people to top roles. So today we're checking in with political scientist Julia Azari, co-author of the Good Politics, Bad Politics substack and author of a great new piece on why delusions about mandates can produce terrible governing outcomes. Welcome back on, Julia. Thank you so much for having me. So it's getting crazy. Elon Musk is privately raging at Trump lawyer Boris Epstein, accusing him of leaking to the media and having too much power over the transition. Meanwhile, Trump just appointed Sebastian Gorka as senior director for counterterrorism. This is a guy with wildly crazy extreme anti-Islam views. The Post quotes a source saying that Trump's national security transition team views Gorka as a clown. Julia, Trump clearly thinks he can govern however he wants to. What's your reaction to all this? Yeah, I think that's right. I think he's selecting people for the administration that clearly aren't meant to build a broad coalition and that clearly are going to come into conflict with each other. And it's pretty typical of kind of mandate overreach when presidents think that they have this sort of public approval for whatever they're doing or even kind of a personal mandate that that it becomes a kind of recipe especially for a second term overreach yeah I, i'm interested in this idea of personal uh, mandate and let's come back to that you wrote this great piece about presidential mandates trump is declaring that he has this massive mandate it's nonsense he didn't even win a popular majority it's a very slim victory but regardless as you wrote Claims like this of mandates have historically been linked to big expansions of presidential power and to unchecked presidencies. And I think we're looking at an unchecked presidency right now about to hit us. Can you talk about all this? Yeah. One of the arguments that I made in the piece, which is based on a, a book that I published in 2014, is that when presidents start talking about how they have the approval of the electorate for what they want to do, this tends to be associated with not just policy, but with this sort of expansive claims about what the president can do. Essentially, the idea of an electoral mandate 
is something that's designed to to kind of run roughshod on checks and balances, whether those be from the other branches of government or from kind of the electorate, the media, you know, mandate claims often are invoked in a sort of situation where presidents are experiencing some pushback and they go on the defensive and they say, well, my critics are promoting this scandal uh, that was Nixon and Watergate, or my critics are asking me too many questions because they don't believe in the mandate that I won. And so my kind of point in the piece is to be very wary of these kinds of claims. So it, it seems interesting to me that there's a, an added nuance with Trump, right? As you mentioned, presidents invoke mandates as a way to push back against resistance to their agendas, institutional resistance, whatever it is. But in this case, uh, we're, we're in a bit of a unique situation because he's coming back into power after having had a presidency, of course. And in that presidency, he was reined in by his own people. So now he's picking all these people who will not rein him in. And he's essentially running roughshod over the very idea that he should have anyone internally that acts as a check. And clearly that's related to this concept of a personal mandate, right? He must really be sort of besotted with that idea. Can you talk about that particular confluence, him, you know, really coming in and being adamantly devoted to not having internal checks and also thinking he has a personal mandate? That's kind of unique, right? It is a little bit unique. Um, where the book leaves off kind of with Obama and it it sort of veers into um, a lot of the things I talk about in the piece to do with presidents being more taking more of a kind of prime ministerial role and really stepping into a more of a partisan mandate. And we saw that a lot with George W. Bush and Barack Obama. And with with Trump, we see an interesting wrinkle on that because it is very much a kind of partisan and ideological mandate that I think he's trying to claim a mandate for kind of MAGA values. But we get to a point where that's very difficult to distinguish from Trump, the person, and then Trumpism, the idea. Presidents winning a second term often, you know, almost always win more votes than they did the previous time. Um, and also people sort of have a sense of what they're about. And that can be a double-edged sword because you now have a larger coalition and you now feel empowered to say, well, here's what I'm about. Here, here are our priorities. And that can be in tension with a larger coalition. And I do think that that is something that would be interesting to see Trump wrestle with is now that he has a, a more diverse kind of coalition that does not necessarily square with the sort of more pure and distilled approach to MAGA. And as a second term president, you know, we'll see if he cares. We'll see if he cares if he starts losing coalition, but you're already seeing this in the administration, as you've pointed out in the new kind of appointees that they're all saying different things about what their priorities are. And Trump will soon learn, I think, kind of the limits of what he can personally do. It's interesting because I think he's always kind of thought all through the campaign, the 2024 campaign, I mean, that he doesn't have to reach out to swing voters or particular constituencies who are outside what we think of as MAGA. Uh, he's thought that uh, essentially he doesn't have to do that because he believed on some level that all he had to do is activate the latent MAGA tendencies in these constituencies and they would uh, you know, rally to his side. Now, I don't think that's what happened. I think a lot of these uh, additional constituencies like the low propensity voters that we talk about, especially young and non-white that came out for Trump, maybe uh, a non-college white low propensity voters. These are people who were, I think, driven more by inflation and unhappiness with the status quo and maybe post-COVID trauma than any latent MAGA tendencies that he activated. But he's going to think that they're all MAGA. And so this broader coalition you're talking about isn't going to give him pause. I mean, isn't that kind of alarming? Yeah, I mean, this has always been kind of a a puzzle um, with the with Trump is just how responsive is Trump land to to what they perceive as public opinion. And in the first term, it was very much a kind of minority rule situation, and there were all these questions about what are they responsive to public pressure? Um, are they just determined to kind of delegitimize and discredit any election that they lose? And that was kind of the story of 2020. Well, we, in some ways, we're in uncharted territory with Trump as a as a, any kind of electoral winner, even as small as that margin is looking like it's um, going to be. T to me, the question actually is 
somewhat beyond Trump world. There's this question about overreach. There's this question about coalition management. And will Trump feel compelled to manage his coalition? And then there was this question about how will the rest of the country treat that? And specifically, how will mainstream media sources treat that? And will we have to sort of listen to uh, frameworks that that promote Trump as having a popular mandate? And that, to me, is a real area of concern. And I've looked into how media outlets framed his 2016 electoral college victory. And they're, you know, they're quite alarming about you know, all these reasons why Trump won, and, and very few of them take into account that he actually lost the popular vote by 3 million votes in that year. So when we have a situation where he's going to have won the popular vote by a couple of, you know, whatever it is, a um, couple of percentage points, then um, how will media outlets think about that? And so I'm concerned that it will, it will create a kind of cushion for him in the public mind that will enable this overreach. Well, we are seeing this overreach in a major way. I want to return to Sebastian Gorka for a sec. It's worth noting how extreme he really is. He constantly talks about Islam as a threat to Western civilization, has pushed nonsense about Sharia law coming to the U.S., big proponent of Trump's first-term Muslim ban, and he was pushed out of Trump's first administration. And the Post is also reporting that Michael Anton has pulled out of contention for a top national security position rather than work with Gorka. For listeners who don't know, uh, Anton is a major MAGA figure, notoriously claimed in 2016 that only Trump can save our country from catastrophe. If Trump's new pick is too much for Anton, I mean, doesn't that really raise major alarms about how uh, how much he's already going down the road of overreach and governing? I mean, he's he's got Elon Musk talking about immense spending cuts as well. We're seeing a couple of different pieces of evidence that Trump is regarding his his next presidency as one where he will not be able to be constrained. And again, you know, to bring it briefly back to the mandate question, I think this this does have to do with a perception among Republicans that Trump has immense power over their constituents that will lead members of Congress to let him do whatever he wants. And that might not be that might not be totally inaccurate. And the other piece of this that that bears repeating that shows how Trump is going to take what's happened historically and sort of take it to a new level is that often when presidents have done this and engaged in this overreach, like the the prime example in my book is George W. Bush and interpreting 2004 as a mandate for his social security plan, which Mm -hmm. just was a complete misread of the electorate. But that was legislation, right? He had to pursue that through Congress and his members of his own party were pretty um, quick to let him know that that wasn't, the direction they wanted to go. What Trump is doing is he's demonstrating this through extreme personnel choices and demonstrating that dominance over Congress through this this recess appointment battle and through appointments of people who are really far outside of the mainstream. And the same thing with with the selection of, of Gorka that we keep coming back to. And so to pursue these policies through the executive branch is a a kind of overreach that's less likely to be kind of caught out and corrected in the way that it has been when presidents have have taken it to the legislative arena. This episode is brought to you by Etsy. Oh. Hear that? Okay. Thank you. Etsy knows these aren't the sounds of holiday gifting. Well, not the ones you're hoping for. You want squeals of delight. (coughs) Happy tears. How? Teach you and spontaneously written songs of joy. I am so happy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. The song needs a bit of work, but anyway, to get those reactions, make sure everyone on your list feels heard with handmade, handpicked, and designed gifts from small shops on Etsy. Gifts like personalized jewelry, custom artwork, cozy style items, vintage pieces, and home decor to celebrate all of your favorite people and their specific kind of special. For original gifts that say, I get you, Etsy has it. So what makes Trump a bit different here in terms of these vows of executive overreach is that he openly campaigned on a series of extreme threats and pronouncements, right? Explicitly vowed to run essentially an authoritarian presidency, prosecuting enemies, unleashing state power on media companies that displease him, openly promised mass deportations with giant camps in the military, 
uh, talked about using the military in blue areas of the country, concluded with a big rally that put virulent racism on open display and so forth. Is there an kind of added danger here that he thinks he's got a mandate for all of that? I mean, that's a lot of that can be done executively. Yeah, I think that that's right. And I do think that one of the things that uh, I was kind of trying to get out in the piece and that you alluded to before is that we have we have sort of two things going on. And one is a very distinct and clear Trumpist ideology that is that is very hostile to checks and balances on power and very hostile to the give and take of politics and very nativist, right? Very hostile to immigrants and immigration. And that's that's very distinct. And all of us who pay a lot of attention to politics understand that that's what that is. And that, I mean, you sort of see that in the way that the campaign unfolded in which a number of of former Republican officials came out against Trump. And so it looked at the elite level like you had this sort of huge, broad ideological spectrum anti-MAGA coalition. And then we got to election night. And the returns looked quite different. And even though Trump's margin, again, I, I, you know, we can't emphasize enough that like most presidents in the 21st century, it's a very narrow margin. But there is a clear shift away from the Democrats across a lot of different groups and regions. And that seems much more consistent with a much kind of shallower and less ideological understanding of politics, which is that essentially (laughs) the electorate turns against the party in power unless things are really good and they haven't been. And so you have, on the one hand, people who are kind of upset about inflation, upset about COVID, kind of have a rosy, nostalgic view of Trump's former presidency. We do tend to be very rosy about former presidents. It just usually doesn't matter. Um, And then you you put that at, at odds with this sort of idea of a really distinct and clear MAGA oriented campaign that probably a lot of people weren't paying that much attention to. That's that's the tension I think we're sort of navigating. And then the question is, does Trump see this as claiming a mandate as a way to get other actors to do his legitimacy work for him? Or does he not does he not even care about that and see this as a sort of boon to his raw power? Are we not even playing a kind of legitimacy game anymore? I know those are those are really abstract questions, but I think they're actually quite quite relevant to thinking about how to return a sense of checks and balances to this situation. I do want to just tell listeners what Trump actually won by. He won by around 1.65 percent of the popular vote as of Dave Wasserman's most recent count. Yeah, this is his first um, really, you know, showing of of having popular support. But I guess for me, I also want to put it in the context of of other presidential victories, which is even when you do win by what would be a modern landslide, uh, you know, a 7 million or more vote or, you know, a 53% of the popular vote or whatever, I'm still skeptical of the concept. So I think there's there's sort of two tracks of my thinking. And one is the way this specifically maps on to Trumpism that is alarming because of all the democratic flaws in Trumpism. And the other is just simply that that presidential mandate claiming is not very small d democratic, no matter who's doing it or what circumstances, because again, it is really designed as a way to push back on institutional checks as well as a kind of uh, political pushback. Yeah. And in Trump's case, he's clearly invoking it as a way to not just keep Republicans in line in Congress, but also to kind of let his people internally know that there's not going to be anything standing in in the way of the juggernaut. Yeah, I think that's yeah, I think that's that's exactly that's exactly right. Let's just close out with a comparison back to 2004 since you brought that up earlier. George W. Bush won a popular majority in 2004, Iraq war. Uh, It seemed like the hold that that uh, Bush and Karl Rove had over the country's discourse and media was absolutely invincible. If you remember the time, it seemed like there was no way to get a, a contrary message through to people. He seemed to have absolute lock on public opinion uh, due to the war. Two years later, uh, a combination of Bush's incompetence because of Hurricane Katrina, uh, the corruption of the Republican Party, Iraq war going south. And as you pointed out, the overreach with Social Security 
led to a massive Democratic victory in the midterms in 2006. They took back both chambers. I'm wondering if we can kind of see something similar shaping up here. I know it's early days and this is speculative, and I don't think Democrats can get back the Senate. But it does look to me like the ingredients are there. Uh, executive and legislative overreach is likely. Um, so is incompetence, lots of bumbling, uh, potentially some sort of major governing failure if there's you know, another pandemic or something like that. What do you think? I mean, is that a reasonable way to look at what might be coming? Yeah, I think politics is, is very thermostatic and fortunes change very quickly. Um, and I think that the, the Bush Obama years are a really good example of this. Yeah. Um, taken, you know, taken as a whole, as you said, 2004, the Republicans looked very strong. By 2006, things had changed. By 2008, they'd changed dramatically. And yeah. by two, in 2008, you know, I, um, Obama also was kind of claiming massive mandates. And then by 2010, his fortunes had changed dramatically as well. Absolutely. So, yeah, I think there's there's a lot of that kind of I know political scientists like this term thermostatic and probably no one else likes it, but I like it. <laughs> OK, great. It, you know, just kind of suggests that people move against whatever the prevailing power is. And I think that's quite likely and it's quite likely given what we've seen with Trump. I, I do think that the the determination to consolidate power gives me some pause and some concern, but I don't know that they'll be able to consolidate power in a way that renders the coming 2026 midterms meaningless. So that's really the that's really the mindset that I'm bringing in. I think mandate claiming definitely comes before the fall. The the extent to which a president thinks I have really made my my views clear to the electorate and the electorate has sent me with a ringing endorsement that almost always precedes uh, some serious midterm loss or some you know, serious, even losing status within their party because they've misread what what everyone in the party is is looking at, looking for as well. And we're certainly seeing signs of that even before Trump takes office in January. Yep. And I would say that if there's anyone who's even more prone to misread uh, mandates for himself, it's uh, Donald Trump. Julia Azari, that is so interesting. Thank you so much for coming on with us. Thank you. You've been listening to The Daily Blast with me, your host, Greg Sargent. The Daily Blast is a New Republic podcast and is produced by Riley Fessler and the DSR Network. 